Haunted by the Past by Tuaway. As the sun peers through the narrow slits in the fine Venetian blinds, Maureen kicked off the covers. While she looked around the dilapidated room, she mused as to why she couldn't bear to change it. What about this room, her bedroom, was so important? It hardly mattered. Nothing mattered anymore. Hadn't for years. Staggering her cold, naked body towards the door, she dragged the blanket off her bed behind her. She felt stronger, more in control of herself and her emotions. Still a wreck, though. If she could see herself in a mirror, she would hardly recognize the specter of her former self. With a shambling shrug, she hoisted the lapidated blanket over her shoulders. Somehow, there was still no respite from the frigid fall air. Grasping the door handle feebly, she twisted. A small victory, as the door gently swung ajar. Moving down the hallway, she mused at the paintings and pictures on the wall. She couldn't recognize much of it. Children's artwork, presumably Harold's, between photos of... Relatives? It felt like an eternity since she'd left that room. Everything about the house was foreign to her. As Maureen turned the dark corner and glided into the kitchen, a question formed in her mind. A question she'd had for so many years. Why do I bother? Why get out of bed? Why change the house at all? Why go on living? Why? Her thoughts were interrupted as she glanced at the calendar on the fridge. Barely discernible in the pre-dawn light, October 28th, the day she lost Harold. Harold, her beautiful boy, her infant son. The moment he was lost to her, she was lost to the world. Haunted by tragedy, it all came creeping back. Before she knew it, Maureen was struck by the scent of fried food. Chicken fingers! The frigid air was replaced by warmth. Not just from the chugging, dated heater, but from love and happiness. She remembered how tired she was, working two jobs to care for Harold alone. Living in her father's old home, just to make ends meet. Taking in her surroundings and basking in a strange, nostalgic euphoria, something almost made her scream. Just like it did every single year. Young Harold sat at the table, pushing chicken fingers around his plate with one particularly long poultry digit. The sun caught his golden blonde hair, nearly blinding her. Tears began to stream down her face. Maureen could see herself in the corner, fifteen years younger, preoccupied with a phone call. The old corded phone's coil entwined between her fingers. She looked happy. Who was she talking to? Mommy? Young Harold began. I'm thirsty. Young Maureen held up a single finger, too busy for her darling boy, and turned away to face the window. A pit began to form in her stomach, as Maureen watched her naive younger self disregard their child. Young Harold stood, frustrated, and made his way to the cupboard under the sink. Quietly, he pulled out a colorful little bottle with a cute little lemon on it and smiled. Helplessly, Maureen began to yell. To Harold, to herself, to anyone who could hear her. But nothing came out. She was frozen, in place and time. Dread washed over her as young Harold poured the liquid into his cup. He made a confused face as he held it to his nose. No! Harold put down the glass. A momentary relief. With great fervor, Harold began to wolf down his chicken fingers. Young Maureen hung up the phone and approached the table, ignorant of the mighty thirst that young Harold's salty chicken fingers had wrought. As Harold picked up the cup again and put it to his lips, young Maureen noticed a cleaning solution on the table. Curiously, she picked the bottle up. Gulp and thoroughly examined it. Gulp. Young Maureen froze, turning her gaze to Harold. 
he put the half-empty cup back on the table and grimaced. All the while rooted in place, Maureen screamed a bloody murder at her younger self in futility. Young Harold turned an awkward, greenish pale before his shallow breaths turned to convulsions. Moments later, he was on the floor. Maureen ran to him, screaming. Panicked, she rushed to the phone. As Maureen watched the horrific scene replay itself in front of her eyes for the fourteenth time, she fell to her knees and wept. How long did she wail, cry, and scream? She couldn't say. Time felt little more than an abstract concept to her these days. Finally, the house resumed its normal silence. Maureen wiped her face. She was back in the cold, unlit kitchen. But like everything in the house, aside from her room, things were different. A new fridge, different shelves, and a child's safety lock on the cabinet under the sink. The sorrow overwhelmed her as it did before. When they took Harold to the hospital, when the police accusingly questioned her, when she attempted to take her own life, she knew it was too late for Harold. Why? Why do I relive this every year? As the sadness faded, her pitiful form stood, emboldened by a new emotion. Anger. Anger at herself. Anger what she had become. And, despite her unwillingness to come to grips with it, anger at Harold. Should have known better, she hissed to herself. Maureen had lost what little composure this life offered her. Just as she did every year. She began to rampage about the kitchen, throwing cutlery, smashing dishes. It seemed funny in a strange way that this, of all days, was when she felt the strength to do so. Soon the kitchen was a disaster, but she wasn't finished. Maureen howled like a banshee, a mixture of screams and cries. That is, until something broke her chaotic tradition. A voice. A woman's voice. This is insane! Every fucking year?! Honey, it's just the one day. We can... A second voice stopped as the two strangers turned the corner to the kitchen. The couple was momentarily speechless as they turned on the lights. Maureen stood, naked, blanket on the floor as the couple stared straight at her. Or rather, right through her at the horrible mess. This can't be real! How can we make a home here? The woman yelled to the man. It's... It's never been this bad before. Maureen, now seething with rage, began to scream even louder. The couple was paralyzed by the shriek. The woman fell to her knees, hands clasped over her ears, as the man ran to the cupboard under the sink, and desperately fumbled with the confounding childproof lock. Moments later, he pulled out a sprig of dried sage and matches, and hastily lit the end ablaze. A thick white smoke began to billow out. To Maureen, it seemed as though it engulfed the entire kitchen. Her shrieks were halted, replaced by hacking coughs. She began to feel weak and frail, the state to which she was accustomed. We can't live like this. We can't raise a child here, Harry. She's only getting worse. Maureen heard the woman plead through tears before storming out. The man stood for a moment, taking in the anarchic display. With a sigh, he walked back to the cupboard, put the sage and matches back, and pulled out a small stained scrap of paper. 204-555-9386, Father Walter. Maureen stared at the man, wondering why he hadn't acknowledged her. There was something familiar about him. The man thumbed the paper and pulled out his cell phone. He took a deep breath muttering to himself. Damn it, Mom. Ek Ushka by Scottish Terror The Highlands of Scotland continue to be a source of fascination for those who are not used to such remote areas. 
with the fanciful imagery of old still being widely believed, even if they no longer hold truth. With these images come the associated legends of magic and mystery that helped shape the identity of the nation, but have long since given way to more rational thought and practices. This has not stopped some of these legends continuing into the modern era, mostly to draw in tourists, such as the famous Loch Ness Monster. A less known creature of Scottish legend is the Och Ushka, which people in the past believed to be the most dangerous of all the fantastical beasts and monsters that roamed the land. A vicious man-eater by nature and closely related to another monster known as the Kelpie, the Achushka was envisioned as a monstrous horse that would lure the unwary to their doom, drowning them in locks or streams before mutilating their bodies, leaving only their liver intact which would float to the surface. The Achushka was considered to be worse than your average monster, for it was one of the fairy folk, intelligent and often dangerous spirits of the wild that could plague mankind with all manner of mischief. The Achushka manifested its supernatural powers via shape-shifting or making its skin akin to glue, trapping a victim who dared to ride upon it and leading them into their deaths. Like all fairy folk, it was considered midway between a pagan being of nature and a spirit of the dead. With the advent of Christianity, many superstitions were formed on how to deal with the Achushka and its already horrific nature was further demonized as the church began to turn people against the fairy folk, denouncing them not just as spirits of the dead, but rather as servants of Satan himself. In the 21st century, the belief of the Yahushka died with the coming of science, and even the remote regions of Scotland, the coming of technology and reason, saw the tales of the Yahushka resigned to fairy tales and tourist attractions. That brings us to the tale of Edward, a 27-year-old man who had taken a keen interest in folklore from around the world. Considered eccentric by his friends and family alike, he often spent a great deal of time and effort exploring remote areas of the world in search of cryptids and other impossible beasts. In five years of searching, however, Edward had never truly experienced anything he could consider paranormal. Thus, as he set off into the Scottish Highlands in search of the mythical water horse, he was not expecting much. Though he still held on to a small hope within him that someday he would witness something truly remarkable. Armed with little more than a camera, a map, and a hired van, Edward drove past scenery that could rival any fantasy book in its beauty and isolation, although roads and sheep-shorn countryside show that humans were making their mark even in the highlands, the land itself was still very much wild and untamed. Edward didn't take long to find a stretch of water he had been told about by a local in a town he had stopped by in his travels. Although he was fairly certain the man was either drunk or slightly mocking, he decided that he was his best lead. His attempts to get answers from others were met with either strange looks or questioning of his sanity. Even here, people had long stopped believing in fairy tales. Unable to take his van across the wilderness, he pulled over to the side of the road and headed to the stretch of water, noticing how mist had already begun to form. This was not an unusual occurrence in the highlands, however, and he didn't give it much thought as he continued on his way. The ground beneath Edward's feet gradually got more and more soft as he found himself walking in marsh, becoming slightly concerned as he found himself sinking and pausing, beginning to doubt if continuing further was safe. Yet, the stretch of water seemed so very close and Edward decided to cautiously continue onward. By the time Edward had arrived at the edge of the water, the ground was so soft he had to move slow and steady to avoid getting stuck. The mist was now thick and cold. To the point Edward realized that he could no longer see the van or the road. At this point, common sense began to overtake his curiosity, and he decided to start heading back, not wishing to risk further danger in such unpredictable circumstances. Yet, as Edward turned to go, he found himself staring at a vision that made his heart race and eyes widened in shock. 
his skin turning as pale as chalk as he struggled to keep himself from crying out in sheer panic. A tall figure stood a few feet away from him in the mist, bipedal but far from human, arms long enough to scrape against the ground, and a horrific head resembling a rotting horse with a flowing wet mane covered in seaweed. The stench of rancid meat and foul water assaulted Edward as the creatures stood in silence, the mist doing little to hide the gaping wound that formed in its skeletal chest, revealing a malformed yet fully beating heart and what appeared to be small crabs and shellfish moving around inside wounds that had long been drained of blood, like a withered corpse that had been left at sea. Edward trembled as the figure finally began to move, revealing large cloven hooves that sunk deeply into the marsh as the creature headed slowly towards him, its head bobbing up and down as if unable to fully support itself, steaming breath emerging from a wicked mouth that spread to reveal misshapen teeth so rotten that many had begun to splinter and crack. A long tongue as black as tar rolled out as if tasting the air. It was at this point Edward realized a disturbing truth. The creature was blind, its eyes milky white as it paused every now and then to taste the air. Large, torn ears swiveling around atop its head as it dragged its arms behind it with every heavy step it took. Unable to take it any longer, Edward tried to run, but found himself slipping in the marsh. Desperately getting to his feet, he continued the pattern of stumbling, his panic making him scramble on all fours in order to try and escape the beast that stood before him. Yet, as he struggled, he found the mist closing in, and he closed his eyes, feeling as if his sanity was breaking as he tried to convince himself it was all a nightmare, even as the smell of death grew closer. Three days later, a local family reported an abandoned van by the corner of the road near a remote section of the highlands. After an investigation, the owner of the van was found drowned in a nearby stretch of water. The cause of death remained a mystery, though it was believed the man must have slipped somehow and knocked his head on a rock, a wound on his skull seeming to indicate such. With no signs of foul play, the death was considered a tragic accident, and authorities closed off the area. Though no one would ever know the truth about the late Edward, who learned too late that there are still some things that should be left alone. The Possession of Annalise Mitchell By The Silent 154 In late 1952, a girl named Annalise Mitchell was born in Liebelfing, Germany, to a Catholic Pentecostal family. She lived a fairly normal life, being described as withdrawn and religious, and even graduating from college. By early 1972, she had experienced many seizures, leading to her being diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy and depression. She started to become secluded from her family, and had become intolerant of religious objects. She even began to hear voices she described as the devils. Despite having severe cases of arachnophobia and ophidiophobia, the fear of spiders and snakes respectively, she became obsessed with the creatures. By 1973 to 1974, she had become very skinny and underweight due to malnutrition and dehydration, she also began to speak fluent Latin, despite never learning how to. Her family became concerned when she drew hundreds of Ouroboros on the wall. The Catholic Church, upon hearing this strange case, decided to send a bishop and an exorcist. When they saw her, they believed her to be possessed by 47 demons. She tried to stay away from these religious leaders, stating, Everything is pain. Let this innocent girl die in fluent Latin. She also chanted, Valak will damn you all to hell. At some point, maybe a year later, she spoke backwards in Latin and drew pentagrams and upside-down crosses on the walls of her room, which she locked herself in. 
She also spoke in tongues, which some believes is a sign of the unholy, even to this day. On July 1st, 1976, Annalise died of starvation and dehydration. Before her death, she underwent 67 exorcisms, all of which apparently failed. Her parents and the Catholic Church were both charged with neglectful homicide, the former being sentenced to six months in jail and a three-year probation. To this day, Annalise Mitchell is buried in Friedhof Klingenberg am Main, Germany.